classes as well. All right, everybody ready to get started? All right, good morning. Thank you all for filling with the weather and getting here timely. Um, my name is Kim Hoff. I'm the Deputy Director of Finance here at the airport. Um, just by way we were recording this, I'm going to just formally talk through why we're here before I get started. Uh, we're here for the San Jose Airport Food and Beverage Concession RFP. The RFP number is 181942, and this is the pre-proposal conference. So I am um, very excited to have all of you here today, and I do thank you for being here. Um, this is the first RFP that we've conducted since 2008, so it's been a bit of time. Um, as part of our RFP, we will be offering over 17,500 square feet of space with three different packages. Um, a very impressive statistic, our uh, concessional sales have grown more than 75% since 2014. And in comparison, the passenger growth has been approximately 55%. So that's attributable to our operators' emphasis on product quality, customer service, and just improving their operations in general. So really nice job. Um, I'm going to do the introductions. So different folks that um, you will meet today and will be speaking with or be presenting to you as well. Um, Irv Tosk, Senior Property Manager. Uh, Jay Lamper is with our operations group who will be talking through some of the key operations considerations for the uh, build-out. Um, Carla and Tim, Carla Merkins, Tim Duffy from Facilities uh, will share um, some items related to the facilities as well. Uh, Mark Heal, our Air Service Development Manager, will give some updates on what's happening in the area. Um, Aaron Yashiro, Senior Architect, will talk about some of the the capital build-out and design uh, criteria. And Magdalena Nadal, a uh, senior analyst, will talk a little bit about ACDBE. Um, and I do want to give special thanks to our properties team who has put this all together, to Rebecca Gray, <coughs> Megan Bush, and Marty Bagna. I probably did not pronounce his name correctly, but <laughs> anyway, so I'm going to turn it over to Irv Tosk now. Good morning. So clearly, uh, we can't take you through every line of the RFP. So we've selected areas that we'd like to highlight and uh, make sure that you understand that these need to be thoroughly addressed. Interpretation of information. Proposers may rely only upon written information and or instructions from the city. Proposers shall not rely upon and the city shall not be responsible for any oral information and or instructions given with regard to this argument. Obviously, the RFP was released on January 4th. Today is the pre-proposal conference and tour. The deadline for submitting questions is January 23rd. The addendum or the answers to the questions will be posted on BitSync on January 30th. And the submittal deadline for the proposal is March 14th at 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Oral interviews are expected April 2nd and April 3rd. The RFP consists of three separate packages. One for the prime operator, which will be about 15,524 feet, and uh, consists of locations throughout Terminal A and Terminal B. Package two is for one medium-sized location, and it's 1,166 feet and located in Terminal B. And package three is for one small-sized location, 
consisting of 876 square feet, also located in Terminal B. Anyone can propose on any of the packages for which they qualify. Contingency bids. Contingency bids will be allowed only for packages two and three. This means that you may propose on these spaces, but selected vote proposal can opt out of the award if they are not selected for the prime package. No contingency bids will be accepted for the prime package whatsoever. Proposal will be returned unevaluated and non-responsive should you propose as such. You must be for each package individually. The locations that are out for bid are the purple colored ones, the lavender ones. If you notice, there is nothing available in A plus, but we have significant locations in A. The checkpoint is here, and we have these locations as well as these locations as well.
conditions of the RFP. The term of the agreement is 15 years with a single five-year option to extend upon mutual agreement. The concession fee for year one is essentially a percentage rent only, and that is broken down for each location, 8% up to a million dollars, 10% from one to two million dollars, and 13% over two million dollars. For year two, we take the minimum annual guarantee that was proposed, and so it's the greater of what was proposed uh, or the percentage of sales stated above in the same 8, 7, and 13% categories. Year three, commencing on July 1st, 2020, it will be the greater of MAG equal to 85% of the previous year's percentage sales paid to the airport or percentage of sales as stated above. At no time shall the MAG be less than the previous year's MAG. As you know, this agreement is for a rather long period of time, and um, there's always a possibility that we could have a fabulous 15 years, but also that you know, there may be some recessionary periods. So we've taken that into account, and if there is a greater than 15% decline in passengers, um, we adjust and that becomes your new map. Pricing policy proposes to propose a percentage above street pricing, not to exceed 15% over street pricing. Clearly, the airport would like to see a lower number, but we understand, given certain costs that affect the program, um, we will accept up to a 15% over street price. Capital investment. The minimum, minimum capital investment is $700 per square during the refurbishment period, which is prior, just prior to the 15 years, um, if, that act, uh, if that option is extended, it, the concession areas will need to be refurbished and the amount will be equal 10% of the actual invested, capital invested into the initial build-out. Refurbishment must be completed by June 30th, 2035. So if you're extended an additional five years, you will be fully refurbished for that period of time. Program goals and objectives. For detailed description of goals and objectives, please see the RFP. Can you guys hear me or should I speak? Stand closer to the microphone. No, you're fine. You're good. Okay. <coughs> Maximize customer satisfaction by creating a variety of high quality products to broad customer base while providing at a minimum competitive pricing, cleanliness, quality, broad selection, and service across all times of the day. Provide well-known, market-tested, and recognizable local, national, and regional brands. Wide selection on today's variety areas, food, trends, and lifestyle. Mix of categories that do not conflict with the airport's existing concepts, not part of this RFP. We want a high level of design and finish. Present attractive, welcoming concessions. Present attractive, welcoming concessions that promote the look and feel of the city of San Jose and Silicon Valley, and that create a sense of place for passengers and for airport users. For those who may not know, uh, San Jose is the 10th largest city in the United States third largest on the west coast, and is commonly known as the capital of Silicon Valley. So it's important to us 
to reflect that into whatever your proposals are. You need to comply with living wage ordinance, prevailing wage policy, and recruit a qualified concession workforce. Practice an environmentally conscious business operation, allow for strong financial return for the successful proposer or proposers and the city, and integrate the newest and latest technology. The city's desire is to find the right mix of local, regional, and national brand concepts to provide a wide product niche and service levels. It is up to the proposer to determine what concept mix should be included in their packages. Concept types are open to your proposal unless otherwise stated in the RFP. No less in the current number of bars, which should be generally remain in their current location, and adult beverage sales can be added where alcohol beverage control laws allow to be met. Justification, including a performa for the highest and best use, will be required. Products tailored to multiple market segments. All concepts must serve all day parts, and we need to have you be careful of concept adjacencies. Obviously, we're not going to accept two coffee shops right next to each other. So you've got to be cognizant of what exists while the way you put together the program. The city reserves the right to negotiate the final concepts with the successful proposal of any package. They are to reflect the character, lifestyle, and culture of San Jose area. Design is appealing, inviting, and exciting. Minimum qualifications. Package one, which is the prime operator package. You need five consecutive years within the past 10 years in all of the following areas. Development, design, financing, construction, leasing, and management of food and beverage and multi-unit concession program in one or more airports of comparable size to the airport or other high volume traffic venues. Aggregate annual airport concession road sales of not less than $15 million per year over a five-year period within the last 10 years. The prime proposing entity must meet the minimum qualification. Businesses without such experience are encouraged to partner with an entity with such experience. Minimum qualifications for package two and three. Three years of continuous operation within the past five years in the ownership or operation and management of a food and beverage business. Aggregate annual gross sales of not less than $1 million per year over three years within the past five years. Experience operating in an airport or other high traffic venue location is preferred but not required. Participants may combine their years of experience to meet the minimum qualifications. Evaluation criteria. The submitted proposals will be evaluated based on goals and objectives outlined in the RFP and the following information submitted. General information which will include things like the proposal checklist, the letter which um, introduces your firm to the airport, um, bonds, things of that nature. It's all laid out in the work. Proposed concepts and designs, qualifications and experience, proposal bid, sales and revenue projections, proposed capital investment, 
management, operational, customer service, and marketing plans, and supplemental information. Supplemental requirements can be found in the RFP. <coughs> RFP submittal policy. Proposal submissions that are not current, accurate, and or completed accurately in the prescribed format defined in the RFP shall be considered non-responsive and eliminated from further consideration. The city reserves the right to waive minor irregularities in the proposal submittal and or reject any or all proposal submittals. Incomplete and or unsigned proposals will not be considered. This is the form of the checklist that anyone who is proposing needs to fill out. It kind of tells you exactly what is required and gives you an opportunity to make sure you've met all the qualifications and checked off that you've you know, handled all of those situations. Um, then it also has two columns for the airport to double check to make sure you've met those minimum items on the proposal checklist. This is a very broad scale of the timeline. The RP was released January 4th. Award will be spring of 2019. Design begins summer of 2019. And the takeover is July 1st, 2020. Transition plan. Proposers must provide a transition plan as described in the RFP. The winning proposal will take over operation on July 1st, 2020 at 12 a.m. While concessions are under construction, you must provide temporary services. Possible exceptions include the current Einstein and SIP savvy location. The airport does not want concessions under construction over the holidays. Your transition plan should reflect this. Everything is required to be open and operational on June 30th, 2021. Liquidated damages will be assessed if you do not meet this deadline. <coughs> Packages two and three and the current Einstein locations will commence with construction on July 1st, 2020. Operations at SJC. The airport is generally open 20 hours a day, 365 days a year. The airport is generally open 20 hours a day, 365 days a year. Concessions must be properly staffed at all times. Heats and valleys throughout the day and the year occur on a regular basis. Customer service, which includes speed of service, friendliness of service, quality of product, and product availability are key. Hours of operation are established by the airport. Locations must be maintained in a like, new, clean, and orderly condition throughout the term of the contract. Product delivery will need to follow the airport procedures. Pricing policy is also part of the airport procedures and it's laid out in the exemplar. Patios are available at current locations but are not part of the lease space. The space can be used for sales projections. Maintenance plan. The selected operator will be required to pay a share of a maintenance consortium. The new program 
is expected to be rolled out prior to the contract inception. Fees for this program have not yet been estimated, but the maintenance work expected is expected to include minimum quarterly hood cleaning, minimum quarterly cleaning of cruise traps and lines, and um, on-pole maintenance services. Routine maintenance such as trash, table cleaning, and other responsibilities are the responsibility of the operator and other items as needed. I'd like to now introduce you to Jay Lambert, who is Airport Operations Supervisor to give you some information pertaining to security. Good morning. We're going to be talking about just a couple security items that affect uh, concessions. So airport badging, all uh, concession employees will be required to be badged, which includes uh, being fingerprinted and having a background check. Um, please allow at least two weeks uh, for the badging process. Um, sometimes it takes longer or less, but um, please allow at least two weeks. The company is responsible for all badge fees, and the new badge cost is approximately $90. And you can see um, the badging forms and fees at our web page. Um, we do the badging um, appointments are all done online, so you can uh, schedule your employees' uh, badge appointments. Working in the sterile area, uh, the sterile area is the area beyond the security checkpoint, which our tour will be uh, taking place in today. Uh, the employees must all go through security uh, checkpoint when they're open, and you can see the time for Terminal A about 3.45, and <laughs> Terminal B opens at 4 o'clock in the morning. We do have a what we call a baker's round. This allows cooks and other employees that need to get into the terminal uh, earlier than when the checkpoint opens. Uh, the baker route is uh, basically between Terminal A and Terminal B. Uh, construction. This requires a security plan, which you can work through uh, with our uh, department and the property managers. And uh, once you have a security plan, and if you have a mall wall that cordons off the area, then that allows you to do work, uh, construction work during the day allows you to keep prohibited items, tools, in that locked uh, space. Um, any construction work that would be excessively loud or um, create dust or things like that would have to be done after hours. Concession uh, repairs um, are completed at night after operations um, flight operations, and there would be a notice of work for that uh, that would be going through your property rep. And uh, we just feel that with our facilities and operations uh, personnel, just to make sure uh, that any impacts um, or any assistance uh, from uh, operations or facilities um, are coordinated and met. So emergency work such as a dishwasher going out or something that impacts uh, the concession uh, conducting business that can be uh, coordinated uh, during business hours during the day with a approved uh, security guard doing the escort of the prohibited items and the contract. Prohibited items such as uh, knives and tools uh, must be secured um, at the concession and um, the security compliance section does uh, monthly and random prohibited item audits. Um, so 
those uh, items will have to be secured, but then um, inventoried uh, daily and basically checked out to the employee working in the concession. Um, it's very important that we keep record of all prohibited items since this is uh, the sterile area where the passengers uh, have already been screened and are preparing to board flights. Delivery of product. So all sterile area product must be inspected at the Terminal B uh, loading dock by the airport guard. Uh, that guard uh, is provided by um, all the concessions sharing and the cost of that guard. Um, with the delivery of this product, the concession employees with sterile badges, they cannot um, leave the sterile area. Once they do, they have to be re-screened. So this typically takes uh, at least two people, um, one down at the loading dock to move the product, and then they pass it to um, the employee that's uh, still in the sterile area that takes it upstairs. Um, if you are at a concession at um, Terminal A and um, have a vehicle that can go ramp side, then those items would be inspected um, at the Terminal B loading dock by the guard, and then they seal the truck, and then they can proceed to Terminal A on the ramp and then take it upstairs. Uh, the loading dock uh, hours of operation are Monday through Saturday from 4.30 to 12.30. Now we'd like to hear from Paul Merkins and Tim Duffy, um, both from facilities. Caller is a maintenance contract supervisor, Tim a maintenance superintendent, and uh, we're going to give you a bit of an information pertaining to facilities and how they affect the concession. Good morning. I'm here to talk trash. <laughs> the airport has two trash areas located on the lower levels of the airport. There's one in Terminal B, across from Gate 21 on, this, on the first floor, and then another one across from Terminal uh, Gate 9. Um, there are uh, freight elevators in both locations to assist you getting your trash and um, recycled items, etc., back down to these trash areas. It's very important when you're moving trash that you use a properly sized containers and that if you do have a spill, to clean it up. Lawsuits are something that happen a lot in airports. So it can be an employee, it can be a passenger. If you have a spill, please, if you don't have the proper equipment, call the AOC, we'll send custodial. And just a small note, in every trash receptacle can in the terminals facing on the edge, there's absorbent pads, there's wet floor signs. So if you or any of your staff see a spill, run over to the garbage can, open it up, and you'll see a yellow absorbent pads and the, <coughs> and the um, wet floor sign while the custodial gets there to clean up. So the uh, trash bins that we have, and I'll start with, they basically mirror each other, but in Terminal B, they have compactors, and both for recycled and for uh, garbage. Um, and we also have a grease area to take your oils from your oven, your stoves and things. And we have a compactor for cardboard bag, for cardboard. So all clean cardboard should be really, uh, compacted. The custodians actually do the bailing. All you have to do is press a button and uh, it'll, it'll press it down and, and the uh, compactors are very easy to use. And we will provide training. It's so important to us that we would rather you did it right than end up having a big mess in there. And as in, as in the terminals, in the trash room, if you do have a spill, please clean it up. If you need assistance, call us and we'll help you. 
Um, the trash room is not a dump area, so please do not leave your broken equipment, your pallets, none of that should ever go into a compactor. It is a concessionaire's responsibility to remove all broken equipment. Um, and it helps, if we can keep the trash areas help, uh, clean, it really helps prevent uh, bugs and critters and mice and things that end up going up into the terminal. So it's, it's kind of for everybody. Um, so again, if you need help, you're chosen. We will do trainings, train the trainer, whatever the way. We'll do it three shifts. We want you to be able to be safe in those rooms and know how to use the equipment, so I appreciate that. We have a, a new group in the uh, airport, uh, a sustainability team, and I'm part of that team, and the, the program manager asked me to speak to this because we're just beginning, first, the airport is developing our first sustainable management plan, which will serve as the airport's roadmap for reducing resource consumption, environmental impacts, greenhouse gas emissions while promoting social responsibility. This is an exciting endeavor for us and concessionaires will play a vital role in promoting this and implementing it. And they will also be ensuring that we um, we are current and future laws are being and regulation policies are being followed. In this way, you can help create uh, this. You, in this way, you can help shape the future of San Jose Airport. We are look, we are currently looking at the, how the airport and its tenants can improve energy efficiency, conserve water, and reduce waste and manage waste differently. And to do this in a way that will be successful long term, not just a short term fix, but something that we can be proud of and do long term. And, and concessions will be a large part of that. We look forward to working with concessions and adopting a new approaches that will help with the environment, reduce costs, and make it a healthier place for employees and passengers alike. So you'll see that coming down the road as you move through in the process. The airport shipping and receiving, which is located in Terminal Bell B, right next to the trash room, um, is as Jay said, open from um, 4.30 in the morning to 12.30, Monday through Saturday. And so when you're using that, which is a main main way of moving product from Terminal <coughs> B um, up into the concessions uh, through that freight elevator that I mentioned, we want you to be really safe again because uh, moving product is another time when spills happen, and spills are a big concern for the airport maintenance and also for safety purposes. When you move any kind of compressed bottle, we require that it be used via a hand truck, um, chain, never move a cylinder through an airport or anywhere else without it being properly handled. If any of you have ever seen one go off, you know what damage it can do. So, most of, 99% of our concessions are located on the second floor. We're all on the first floor. If, um, if your kitchen sinks, your uh, soda fountains, your uh, drains are not maintained, what happens is it leaks in this room. You might have a leak right now. I know we have one in the other room. And it leaks in public areas. It leaks in our airlines offices, um, our own offices. They don't take kindly to this. No one does. And, it, and again, it can be a hazard. If a concession is maintained, I was a concessionaire for 25 years, so I don't know this for our back. If you maintain your concessions, you maintain your equipment, you can avoid all leaks. Um, to that, Tim Duffy will be speaking about the kitchen maze and maintenance. Thank you for your time and appreciate it. Good luck, everyone.
Good day. I'm uh, Jim Duffy with Airport Maintenance, uh, separate from anything to do with concession maintenance. Uh, typically, the airport maintenance team is the first responder to concession leaks uh, downstairs. So with that, I'm going to just mainly talk about some of the common things we've uh, come across that's common in concession maintenance, anyhow, uh, first responders to leaks and things like that. Uh, so mainly it's uh, kitchen maintenance. So properly maintained kitchens are both uh, properly stored and maintenance go a long way. Uh, proper management goes a long way for the safety of your employees uh, and, their, and, and, and their work day. It also aids the efficient business operations. Attentive cleaning uh, aids in reducing the odors to your uh, concessions, uh, drain flies, bugs, and rodents, uh, and also reduces the tracking of debris into the public area, which would be our terminal uh, uh, footprints. Uh, storage in your concession space, uh, be attentive to the storage of your stock items in your kitchen space. Uh, be attentive to the storage height and the placement of your items and materials. Uh, maintenance of the kitchen is essential and reduces unplanned maintenance enclosures. Uh, the drain, remember, is not a dump and also it prevents clogs. <coughs> so uh, suggestions are, are clean floors, uh, removing buildup of any oils, which can then be tracked into the public spaces and onto the terrazzo floors, and then also reduces slip and falls in the workplace. Uh, clean floors, again, uh, removing dropped materials, product, to keep that from entering your uh, floor drains and into the public areas of the, the terminal. Uh, a suggestion is to consider in your drains in any area, uh, dishwashers, things, is to consider putting inline waste interceptors, which are sort of a filter for many drain lines that drain out of your sinks and stuff. This will aid in the sink drain outflow, being the first line of uh, defense to capture the product that passes through your sinks or your dishwashers uh, and stopping it before it enters the floor drain. And because debris in the drains is uh, not friendly because it creates the clogs. Uh, drain management, consider installing at the drain uh, frontline filters to capture the product before it enters the drain uh, and allow water to still flow. And again, this will reduce the clogs inside your floor drain and reduce unplanned uh, leaks. Uh, SJC has installed uh, some guarding locking floor drains throughout our current concessions and spaces. Uh, these are locking floor drains that go into the floor drains themselves and require a, a security tip, a torque tip, to be removed. Uh, this aids the business by reducing the possibility of one of your team members removing the floor drain covers uh, to allow the drain, you know, the product to go down the drain. So uh, this recently worked as it captured it, the drain and allowed the material to be built up and once it was removed the drain was allowed to flow, otherwise the stuff would have gone down into the drain. Uh, drain line management and maintenance, which is uh, such as power to uh, uh, cleaning your drain lines out and snaking the equipment. Um, this will support the, uh, the proper drain management uh, of fats, oils, and grease, uh, lessening the buildup. Uh, scheduled the PMing of the drain lines, such as jetting and snaking. Uh, suggestion to consider is enzymes, um, to some degree, will help reduce the maintenance needs and better support the reduction of mechanical damages from snaking your lines and stuff. Uh, there is a product example is uh, from ChemSearch. Uh, they have a product called Free Flow and BioAmp. Uh, this company, the reason I'm referencing it is because this company uh, took proactive steps uh, to reach out to the City of San Jose uh, Wastewater Management uh, to uh, work with them and coordinate their product usage of their enzymes uh, 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 for approval versus unimproved enzyme products uh, into the storm, into the sink drains or floor drains. Uh, also, leaks. Leaks can be avoided. Uh, suggestions to see is take your condensation lines out of your soda machine, your ice machine, your refrigerator, things like that, and maybe consider attaching your condensation line into the floor sink drain itself. Uh, this will keep it from inadvertently moving and or then leaking onto the floor, then seeping into the lower spaces below. Uh, so. Fixing the, those lines will aid in the unplanned movement of the drain line, causing leaks to the airport tenants or open public spaces below the concessions, avoiding unwelcome damages. Uh, one of the other things, too, is to consider at night is the faucets. Uh, it's one of the things to do before you close up shop for the night. Check the faucets and make sure that they're shut off at night. We found them uh, left on overnight, and they tend to have cause problems uh, by leaking into the below floors below, so make sure they're closed. Avoid unplanned leaks uh, caused by the running faucets. Uh, also, the grease interceptors and traps servicing. Be attentive to the schedule, the increase of uh, concessions and movement, and uh, clean them ahead of time uh, the schedule if needed uh, to help build the, reduce the waste buildup and uh, 
and services before they're full. That's all I have to do. We're going to take questions at the end of the presentation. So if you have any questions for any of these folks who are up or coming up, or myself, uh, we'll take that at the end. Um, there you go. <laughs> um, here is Mark Hill, our Air Service Development Manager. And we, we're next to the slides. <laughs> we'll, we'll know in a moment. It's hard to follow the, uh, the uh, dream trap. Uh, uh, so welcome everybody. We're very, very glad to have you. Um, we would welcome you to our family here in San Jose. And uh, for those of you who maybe we met last summer when we were doing informational meetings, I'm going to move off airport. Um, my role here really is to develop air service, but as a former business owner, I think you might want to know more about what drives business in this airport, not just from San Jose, but from the Silicon Valley as a whole. If you don't live here, or you don't work here, or you're not familiar, maybe this will help you kind of judge what the future is, because we're not talking about today or tomorrow, we're talking about a 20-year lifespan of business. And so, so I'm going to show you some things that are happening. Uh, we don't guarantee any of this happens. We don't you know, understand exactly how it will translate into business to the airport. But I think when you see these dynamics, uh, you'll feel very um, enthusiastic about the future as we do. So, uh, this is on a background of Google Bikes, for those of you who don't know. This is just kind of a summary that I talk to airlines about. We have, obviously, a very hot economy. We have massive invest investment still taking place and will in the future. Silicon Valley companies and employees have shown a very high preference for the use of this airport within the Bay Area. Uh, we had just passed our all-time record airport uh, level of, uh, of passengers in December, and uh, we have now been, at least by one source, ranked number one for the next many years in national GDP growth. So, so again, if I'm sitting in your chair, I'm looking at the growth potential for the future. Do I want to invest in this? And I think the answer is I do. It's a very complex market and it's very robust. So, this is a picture, or a map rather, of Silicon Valley. You can see why we call ourselves Silicon Valley's airport. For those of you who haven't done driving tours, I did one about two weeks ago with some airline executives. I've taken them out to show them what is close to our airport. And you can see we're surrounded by all the names that are in the news on a daily basis and the companies that are shaping technology on a, on a global uh, basis. So just taking us to where we are today, just so you can kind of see what the baseline is. Over the last five years, we've grown passengers by 63%. We're putting 15,000 more people, more customers for you through the airport every day than we were five years ago. By the time this program goes into effect in a couple of years, our base of business will probably be 70, 75% bigger than it was just five years ago. So already, the again, the established base of business is much larger. So here's a few things. All right, here's our little celebration. Some of you may have seen this. 14.3 million annual passengers is what we surpassed in December. We'll be at 15 shortly by summer. We're headed for 16, 17, 18. So again, you can take a look at the growth and imagine where it's going to be in the years ahead. Um, the business is definitely moving closer to this airport. And uh, again, I think these slides will be made available later for your reference. And I'm not going to read these to you, but the point is, there's land available in San Jose as a city, and these tech companies are moving on gobbling up this land. Again, we're not standing here saying that we're part of that or that we will guarantee that they're going to develop all these properties. But when we look at the list, just west of the airport, just north of the airport, downtown, it's a, it's a massive investment that's, that's, uh, that's taking place. Well, in, the, in the last 12 months, there's been a buying spree for downtown San Jose all by itself, almost a billion and a half dollars, which is about three times what that investment was in the prior 12-month period. 
So again, you see, you see a future developing that we're not even touching today, and that will transform this market. Here's a little bit about employment. Bay Area employment has been strong. Look who leads it, South Bay, that's us. That's the San Jose Airport region that we serve. 43% of all new jobs over the last 12 month period uh, have been in what we would call our market catchment area. Again, I'm trying to answer your question, where's the future? What does this look like 10, 15, 20 years from now? Because that's the investment period that you're looking at. Here's the Google Village, you've probably read about that. It's getting a lot of press. I'm talking about 20, 25,000 employees. You can actually see the site from the south end of our terminal if you look down toward downtown. It's within two miles of here. That's going to transform downtown San Jose and the region around it. And so, again, what's the timeline? Is it going to be three years? Is it going to be five? We don't know, and we're not going to suggest that we do know what it is. But the, but the bottom line is, that these kinds of dynamics, again, are transformative in the Silicon Valley market. Uh, here's another, I'm just gonna show you some pictures because I don't need to read the words, you can kind of see what's happening. If you live here, you read about this every week. If you don't live here, it may still be national news. Here's a new development downtown in San Jose. Here's another thing that just got put next to the tech, we're talking about next to the tech museum, right downtown, again, all walkable, from light rail access to the airport, so it'll be, uh, again, very convenient for customers to come and drive through this airport. Or uh, maybe I should say fly through the airport, actually, that's probably a better term. Adobe is out in a fourth tower, again, part of the uh, dynamics taking place just two miles from here. Uh, this is more examples, again, I keep showing you more pictures. Don't know if any of you saw the Super Bowl 50 a couple of years ago, or the National College game, uh, two weeks ago, it was in Levi Stadium. If you don't know, it's not in San Francisco, even though it's the home of the San Francisco 49ers. It's two miles off the end of our runway. Okay, so it's about 15 minutes up the road, and there's massive development taking place in housing and development right across the road, right across the street from that Levi Stadium is a golf course. And that property is the site that's targeted for what's known as city place. Six and a half billion dollar multifaceted development that is in the works. It's starting to go through environmental and some of those factors. It's not going to open next year. It's not going to open two years from now. But the point is, this is again talking about billions of dollars of investment within eyesight of this airport. Will all those customers come through this airport? Not necessarily. It depends on where they live. But the point is, having all of these things close by says there's business upside here for the next 20 years. Look at this. I don't know if any of you have seen this. This is the Apple, uh, it's called Apple Park. It's affectionately known as the spaceship. Four and a half miles from here. It's a five billion dollar campus. Uh, that building itself is about a little bit long, larger diameter than the Pentagon. That Levi Stadium, I showed you a photo a minute ago, would fit in the middle of this thing. If you haven't seen it, I was over there at the $100 million visitor center two weeks ago with these airline executives so they could see it for themselves. It's very, very close by here. More things. This is Apple. This one is, is actually a huge development. It's still being completed. It's about eight and a half miles from here, right down the freeway. So again, nobody stands still in the Silicon Valley while they're building one thing that's five billion dollars, they're developing other things that might be two. This is, uh, took them over to see this. This is under construction. This is on the Google campus, okay, in Mountain View. Again, very close by, and uh, it's a monster if you haven't seen it. It's, you almost want to just drive by and look at it because it's so interesting. Structural steel is all up, and they're starting to develop, you know, the site. Uh, Microsoft, they're not headquartered here. A lot of these companies have to have a very large presence. Look at what they just acquired, a 65-acre parcel. This is just north of the airport, about two miles. And the point is, they already have a big campus here, even though they're headquartered in Washington State, because they have to be where the talent pool is. They have to be close to the, to the business and to the technology. These are other companies. Samsung, North America, U.S. headquarters, two miles up First Street. Dell, people have said to me, oh, is that Dell's headquarters? It's right over here by the stadium. The answer is no. They're based in Austin, Texas. But when you see the size of their campus here, 
uh, you might mistake it for a corporate headquarters because it's that big. Uh, Ericsson, Toshiba, lots of companies. Automotive sector is very big here because all of these companies have research labs because when you buy a car today, it's all about technology and safety systems. And it has to be driven by Silicon Valley uh, uh, activity. So, so that's it. It's just a bunch of pictures. But again, my job is to show you off airport because your investment is not just about the airport. It's not just about the city. It's about investing in Silicon Valley and what's going to drive customers through this airport in the long run. And I think what we've seen in the last five years uh, again, there's no guarantee that that trend will continue like that. As someone said, there will be, you know, recessionary periods and those types of things. But the point is, they're coming off of a much larger base than we were at just very, very recently. And there's a lot of growth in the, the pipeline driven by massive quantities of investment of every kind surrounding this region. So with that, I'll wrap it up. Um, Aaron Ashiro, the senior architect, and he's going to talk to you about terminal development. Thanks, sir. So, actually, this is a great segue for from coming from Mark and talking about the future development of the city and the and the increase of GDP throughout the, the area. And uh, I just wanted to kind of talk about how the airport, the city the airport actually reacts to this. And we are at a point uh, last year that we we're starting to project that we are going to be uh, physically constrained here at the airport that we could not take more flights and we could not uh, expand. Uh, we couldn't get more efficient with our gates. So in, in relation to that, our senior staff is recognized that and said, hey, we got to do something so that we're not physically constrained and that way we're limiting our potential. So uh, I want to kind of introduce this project here. Is you, For those of you that are here, um, you may have noticed that there's development happening south of Terminal D and that is the interim facility. Uh, right now, we've, um, we, we, we're about the halfway point of the project, and to kind of give you an idea, here's a, the actual facility, and it's a bird's eye view of it. It's gonna be uh, six total gates, five jet bridges, one ground boarding bridge. And it's gonna be 30,000 square feet facility, and we're, spent, we're investing $50 million with this. So with, it's in the best interest of the airport to provide the infrastructure for growth and also provide more opportunity for all of you. So this is the future, this is what's gonna happen. We're, we're looking to open this facility in June, mid-June, mid June, June 15th to be exact. That's when we're gonna take our first flight. So. That is coming up. Okay, so um, I did want to brief, uh, briefly go over the new concession tenant improvement guidelines. So in your RFP, there's a document called Concession Tenant Improvement Design Guidelines. And this is kind of a, this is a game changer to the way we look at concessions in our airport. Uh, right now, our, our concessions reflect a 10-year-old um, concession guideline. And we are looking to improve the storefronts, improve your, your visual attractiveness of your concessions. We want to unlock the creativity for all your designers, your corporate. We don't want to hold you guys back. And that we want to really enhance your storefront and therefore it's becoming more attractive which means more money, more sales and all that. So we're here to um, help you guide, guide that process. A um, couple big items that I really would like to touch on is how what you won't see in the terminal right now and what changes are coming forth in this new tenant and new design criteria is this 
marquee sign. You won't see this anywhere in the terminal right now. And our, our senior staff is, was gracious and wanting to do this, which is going to increase your, your, your exposure to this large uh, passenger community that are coming through our complex every day. So increasing your visibility, um, we, are, we want to grow your storefront out into the concourse. So uh, we're, we're, we want you to have edge lit canopies and you can either suspend your storefront signage or you can put it above it. It's, it's up to your preference. Another thing is in what I like to point out is growing your uh, branding out onto the face of the of the, um, the air, air diffusers. And there's some areas that we have the possibility to do that. Not everywhere is going to have that opportunity, but some areas. Um, another thing is in the areas that we do have patio seating, uh, you'll notice that some of the concessions have patio seating and they're very attracted to create this cityscape within our facility. And what we're trying to do is cr we're, we're creating a consistency to the structure. And in the RFP, you'll, you'll see that we define what sort of structure it is, but the infill panels is basically up to your designer as long as the materials fit within what we require. So that's another opportunity to get some, some brand new ones in there. This is Terminal A, um, and this is what another, this, a continuing of the same potential um, um, the guidelines and edge lit canopies, uh, suspended signage. And this is a new one here too. There are no blade signage in Terminal A, so that will unlock another uh, healthy exposure for your concession. So we're really trying to open it up. Uh, we don't really want to close it up. We really want to encourage any kind of experience-driven dining. If there's a, a concession that is, it, it wants to wants to showcase that, we'd be very open to that, and we'd be excited to see that. Um, so I mean, this is just getting give you guys a, a flair of what's the difference between building in Terminal B versus Terminal A. So that each of them have different advantages and opportunities. So those are very exciting things to think about. So this is the last rendering I have. And this is a very um, important part of, of your, can be a very important part of your RFP because based on where concessions are available, there are opportunities to start creating neighborhood nodes, as we reference in our guidelines, is that we can start defining areas. And this is just an example where we call it sounding market, right? So we can start to not only take on your, your concession names, but we can start to create a theme to the concessions being available. So, which will increase the exposure and start to create a kind of like a community within a facility, a neighborhood. So, those are very, very exciting things that if you walk in the terminal today, you, you will not see any of this. And so, we're looking to the future, we're looking at ways to uh, make it more exciting, more dynamic within the airport environment, but also give you guys the flexibility, the creativity to enhance your um, bottom line as well. So it's a win-win scenario. Things look good, you guys make more money. So that's the way, I, that's, that's a win-win for all of us. Uh, the last slide I got is the design review process. This is a, this is a program that our architectural team takes on in, in agreement with our property managers here at the airport. Um, so our architectural team is basically the administrator of the design review process, but the first step is the conceptual design review, which is, is handled between you as a concessionaire and the property management team and your property manager. So this conceptual design goes to, uh, is presented, it's usually with renderings, basic floor plans, furniture concepts, colors, branding, um, 
maybe specialized signage. And that all goes to our senior staff for preliminary approval. Upon that approval, then we move towards the next step, which is called the Form A submittal. And that is more of a, for, for those of you to understand, uh, for architectural submittals, the first phase is schematic design. And this involves basic floor plans, elevations, sections, perspectives. It's a basic drawing set that can kind of get the overall theme, can get the overall scope, and what you're trying to intend to do. Um, after that, we provide comments in response to your Form A submittal or schematic design, and we issue a letter to you with all our comments. And then we say whether or not you need to resubmit the Form A, or you, have, you move on to the Form B. So if we issue you the, the green light to go ahead for the Form B, then the next step would be to create 90% construction documents, which is our Form B submittal. And from there, we would uh, review that very um, in a detailed manner and uh, provide feedback from all divisions all across the airport. That includes facilities, properties, uh, operations, security, planning development, um, and, and maybe some other senior staff comments. So that will that will also be formalized in a memorialized in a Form B letter, and that will be sent to you. And if it's if it's if it's acceptable, if your design is acceptable to the airport, we'll be issuing a airport approval and closing the Form B process, and that allows you to go to Public Works. And Public Works is the authority having jurisdiction. We, as the airport, we do not provide permits. We do not issue any notice to proceed. That is all handling, is handled by our Public Works and your contractors and your architects. So, um, but as you can see, we're very heavy heavy on the review side for the design review because this is, the, 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 that's how important this design, what, how things are presented in our airport, that's how important things are. So especially with these new design guidelines, you really want to make these concessions sing and, uh, and because it's going to be here for a while. So you really want to do the right thing. So with that, I am concluding the talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Magdalena Nodell, and I actually uh, run our ACDBE program here at San Jose uh, International Airport, and I just wanted to talk to you quickly about um, kind of just what we would expect from our concessionaires. So the program was created to minimize concerns related to minority dis discrimination and, and award the administration of concession opportunities at employing out Found passengers. So we kind of want to create a level playing field. We want to help remove barriers. Um, obviously, we're here to help the smaller um, businesses, but that also can be translated to the primes as well by helping you guys have those resources to those ACDBEs. So use me as a resource to create a list, or if you know you need a certain type of vendor, I can definitely give you the list of ACDBEs that do that type of work. And if you're an ACDBE or maybe even just a small or minority business that you might think that you qualify, I can get you those minimum requirements and kind of help you become an ACDBE and take advantage of this program and be noticed by primes and other companies. Also, we just want to make sure that you adhere to the ACDBE program regulations. It's required to remain eligible to receive grants from airport development for the FAA Airport Improvement Program. Um, so that just means that we do have federal or FAA regulations, so that I do uh, collect reporting monthly, but a lot of times I'll collect it quarterly from all of our concessionaires, and that's just to kind of keep track of their ACDB participation. I also do audits to make sure when they do have ACDBs that they're properly reporting that information, just making sure that that ACDB is getting the proper work in, so they're not being taken advantage of. Um, Next slide. So here at SJC, our current ACDB goal is 10.64%. Um, that's triannually until 2020, so 2018 to 2020. So that will be changing every um, three years. 
and that's based on food and beverage, retail, gift, advertisement, passenger screening services, and so on. And so that again will include those services, whether you're the vendor or or if you're the prime, or if you're the business doing that, then it will cover that. But also if you're prime, the vendors that you use can be covered under that, and that will help you reach that goal. Um, and again, we're going to try to save the questions to the end. But if you do have any questions that I can't answer today, I would suggest using BidSync um, just to keep transparency uh, of the whole RFP conversation. Um, also, I do have on the website our ACDB program. So if you go to flysjc.com, there's a whole list of the ACDB program, more details on that, my contact information, and so on. And thank you again for being here today. Okay, at this point, we'll um, throw the floor open to anyone who may have questions for um, for myself or any of the folks who uh, spoke to you earlier, and uh, we'll do our best to answer them. And if we don't have an answer at the moment, we will certainly answer them and put them in the agenda. Um, and unfortunately, our microphone was not um, too full. So we'll do our best with the equipment we have. <laughs> so how would you look at it a proposal? Can you come down and the closest so everybody can hear? All right, so I'm actually new to this my first time at a um, conference. Um, my question is, how would you analyze a propo proposal for somebody that's bidding on, you know, package two, wherein the similar concept might be for the same, uh, you know, for, for a next door, for the same concept in a different package? Yeah. Well, we have different criteria for the smaller packages than we do for the larger packages. So um, we do our best to enable some of the smaller firms to have an opportunity to uh, have a, a unit at the airport. That's why we carved out some smaller locations. Additional questions? Yes, sir. Hi, uh, uh, <coughs> what is your dollars per, or average dollars per inflating passengers? For food and beverage and retail, yes. it's uh, just under ten dollars. Okay, Gary, what is what is, what is the answer? I'm sorry. Uh, what was the answer to that question? It, the uh, answer was that we're just under ten dollars for employment. Thank you. Hi, my question was: um, Aaron talked about the patio spaces potentially, and I think you mentioned it as well. In the RFP, would you like to see something from proposers as far as what that would maybe look like, or are you going to be putting out something additionally to talk about um, what would be available as far as that goes? Thank you. Uh, we are permitting the existing patios to remain in the program. Uh, it is not part of the lease of the space because um, depending on the fire department, the ADA, and whatever, we may have to um, modify those spaces. But at this point, we've gotten the blessing to go forth. So uh, we would like you to base your, your proposals on including those spaces where they exist today. So when you forecast sales and you include the patio, make sure the patio is included in those forecasts. Is union labor required at the airport? Union labor is not required. You are, uh, but you are um, required under the city to have prevailing wage, living wage, and there's a labor piece component. So um, it's not a requirement, but Many uh, folks do go with the union to um, address those issues. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. well, quite good. <laughs> yes, sir. I said my own opinion is not on the point of the as a minority business model, what is the procedure to work with some existing facilities to make them your dishes? Um, you want to introduce new kind of With working with existing Okay, well, let's, um, the airport doesn't get involved with um, the negotiation between, say, your clients and the individual concessionaires. Uh, we are the ones who evaluate what is being proposed. So my suggestion would be to find out, you know, basically all here, all the primes and or other individual uh, concessionaires who you may want to partner with and discuss your ideas with them and um, base your proposal on some of these new ideas. We're always, always looking for fresh ideas and because we, you know, we're the capital of Silicon Valley, we, it's our goal to, you know, introduce new and fresh, you know, concepts. The question is, is the cost of the list? The list of the list of everybody who is going to be here today, who is here today, will be posted on Bitson. So you'll have everybody who's here. Thank you. All right. Yes, Hi, Sarah McDermott with Unite Here Local 19. Can you speak to the worker retention policy and how you'll be asking bidders to commit to that in the proposal? Well, the worker retention policy is, um, is part of the same policy, which means that all your workers who currently are working at the airport um, are retained for 90 days when there's a transition of concessionaires. And after 90 days, then there's an assessment as to whether they um, fit the um, program as the new concessionaire would like it to be. Does that answer your question? I guess our, our, our what are you looking for for folks in terms of the proposal as how they're going to be adhering to that? Well, there's um, a section in the proposal that addresses that area, and so it needs to be filled out. Okay. Any additional questions? Yes, Ben. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the plan to increase uh, either airline routes or new airlines coming on board? Give that to Mark. <laughs> Thanks, I never get questions, so I'm just on the <laughs> You know, I've been in this business 40 years. It's changed a lot. It'll change again over the next 10, the next 20 years, the life of this uh, com uh, program. Um, yeah, we're always talking to different airlines, not only around the country, but around the world. There have been a lot of mergers. There were fewer airlines certainly today than there were even 10 years ago. Uh, there are airlines that will exist in the future that don't exist today. So I would be shocked if the mix of airlines and the routes that we have served by this airport are the same even three years from now as they are today, let alone 10, 15, or 20. So, um, you know, it's, it's an evolutionary industry. It's a global business and markets that uh, didn't exist again 10 years ago are very large markets attracted to airlines today and I, I, I think that will continue to evolve and so suggesting where we're going to be 5, 10, 15 years from now is really not something that would have a lot of merit to it. Um, we look at the market, we look at the opportunity, we look at the airlines that are good fits for the for the market and uh, can sustain business, and those are our targets. So just like you, our business model changes with the economy, with the globalization of travel, and uh, and with the with the companies that are out there providing product. So uh, I suspect we'll all see something different 10 years from now than we do today.
just want to mention that you'll have a second opportunity to ask questions when we return from the tour. So um, I think we gave out cards that you can just write down any questions that you may uh, have, and um, we'll sit down one more time and quickly go through those questions. Uh, yes, sir. Just one quick one. Uh, any additional or clarification on your uh, ACPD requirements? Please uh, come any additional information you can give us on your goals or requirements of the ACDBs? So we currently have a race neutral ACDB program, so that means that there's no hard goals, but we do want to see you participating and doing your good faith effort and reaching out to me. And if you are an ACDB, reach out to me and I can always send you off to primes that are looking for that. And if you are a prime, you can always reach out to me and I can help you find vendors that are ACDBs. Um, the main thing is that we do need you to report to us monthly. And a lot of times I let you do it quarterly, but as long as it comes to the month information, and that way we can send it off to the FAA and then we do do the audits to make sure that the ACDBs are doing the proper um, work that they've said that to be being do, done, or giving the proper product. Does that does that answer your question? Or well, well I was more of the more of the any uh, actual requirement, which I think is not but maybe a goal or uh, the goal is ten point six four percent, and that's a race neutral. So again, it's not a hard goal, but we do want you to try to reach that. Thank you. Because we are a race neutral airport, um, ACDB uh, goals are not part of the evaluation. We certainly encourage and we have gone from a very small amount to where we are today by encouraging and, and having folks who we think are certifiable go through the process and get certified. We do what we can, but as a race control program, we cannot force that. Okay, does that help? Good, thank you. Uh, any other questions? Okay, then we, I have two more slides, which will be very quick. Communication is strictly prohibited between the proposal vendor and any city employee, including all airport senior staff and city of San Jose council members. The code will be lifted when the director of aviation provides his written recommendation of selection to city council. Should council refer the matter back to the director or staff for further review, the cone shall be reimposed. The cone of silence does not apply to oral communication at pre-bid conferences, oral presentations before selection committees, contract negotiations, any duly noticed public meetings, public presentations made to city council during the duly noticed public meetings, or communications in writing at any time with any city employee, official, or member of city council, unless specifically prohibited by the applicable RFP. Should this provision be violated, the proposal may be disqualified from the bid processes or risk having the award vacated. All updates will be posted to bid So essentially, there, there should be no communication between you and other parties, particularly city employees, potential evaluators. Uh, that's just um, something that we will put. Okay, we are now ready for the tour. Okay, folks, I hope you enjoyed the uh, walk around the airport and uh, 
about our exercise program. Uh, if any of you have additional questions that are on the index cards that we handed out, we would like to collect those so we can uh, address those questions. Uh, anyone who might have a card, please raise your hand. I have a question. Where are the index cards? <laughs> 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 Where are the index cards? Where are the index cards? Let me start with the first question, um, which is, is there natural gas available? And the answer is uh, generally yes. Um, most of the heavy utilities are on the east side of the building, which is this side. Um, but if you need natural gas and you're on the west side, you can go look at that.
when will your next session for our piece come out? It's early in the fall. The next one will be retail. So the next, uh, yeah, so probably the fall 2024. Yeah. So the next one will be retail and probably be on the screen right in 2022. Uh, so there'll be another retail food and beverage about two years later. Concept is unique. Your portfolio, would you want to keep any of the current concepts? And the process will be a kind of space for one staff to make. Is there a part of the uh, because we cannot move any of the patio spaces. Um, as, as I mentioned earlier, they're sort of locked in by the ADA requirements, and ADA can also change the line and decide you know, we're not allowed to have the patio spaces. But right now, at the moment, they're kind of letting us keep what we have, where it's located. So there's no availability for additional things. Um, in terms of keeping um, concepts or in the portfolio, this is something that you need to analyze. And um, as part of this proposal, you need to look at the airport, see what exists, um, what is successful, maybe we would like to take it over and, and arrange a, some kind of arrangement with the franchise or this is this is really in work for as to what we will propose in, in terms of um, concepts. So we, we can really you know tell you what we like, what we want to do. This is something that you can have to tell us what makes the most sense. Other, other food and beverage options going into the new gate area, expansion six gates beyond where the current flows is. Um, that corner uh, is going to have five gates and one loading gate that you know, people load probably around. The width of that corner is extremely narrow. Um, so the only thing we have planned at the moment is a very small bar and um, a grab-and-go sandwich and soda because we can't get more. You know, we sort of kind of stuff before we have. Any other questions about that? Proposed two concepts in one space. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> folks. My name is. Uh, I don't think I've been introduced yet, but it's Craig Beaton. I am the principal of the properties group, so I manage the sessions team as well as the airline folks as well. Um, we haven't answered that question. I quite honestly want to know what's coming up. Um, we haven't made a determination yet whether or not we're going to propose alternate concepts. It, our theory being is, is if you're proposing your best concept, that's your best concept. Right? We, I, I will go back and, and touch on an adjacency question. Um, there was an adjacency question earlier in the, in the program where it was, well, how, how do we evaluate if somebody's proposed something that's similar to what's next to it? First off, as Irvin alluded to, if there's already something that's there, for example, we know we know where the coffee shops are with the exception of the piece. We know where the post locations are, which includes a burger. So if you're proposing a burger close to that, that one's probably not going to be scored as favorably as, say, something that is not in that same kind of category. Not that it can't be, 
it should probably not going to be scored to be scored as, as well. Because again, it is really about finding the right mix of concepts to make the best program. The RFP allows for us to negotiate with the prime concessionaire on the final concepts. That accounts for the adjacencies. So for example, in the Pizza Man Park location, package two, let's say I've got somebody that proposes, I don't know, say Pizza Man Park, and then one of the primes proposes to fill that space where uh, the, you know, the bread or the boo will go up with a lawn chair and an inch and propose a pizza shop. We will not go back to a small operator and say, for the most part, what else do you have in your bag of goodies? Because it's not likely that you will. We will more we will most likely go back to the prime operator and say, what do you have in your bag of goodies that we can we can exchange out? Because we're we're really wanting to make, we're wanting to make sure that we can include local biz, local small businesses inside inside this particular opportunity. So the theory is, is that you should be proposing your best concept. Um, we'll look to finalize an answer in the in the um, in the final addendum, which is I think two weeks from today. Right? Two weeks from today. Um, so right now I just don't have a first time to answer. Thank you. Would the airport consider moving the location of a package of package two to a larger location if the concept required it? Uh, we would not. We essentially are locked into the locations that are in the RFP moment. Prevailing wage are not working. Is there a union requirement? Um, we, as part of the development of the RFP, we did a lot of our own performing work to see uh, what will work and what won't work. And um, we made changes to make sure that vendors could bid on this and, and be profitable. So um, the city policies pertaining to prevailing wage and living wage are, are a fixed situation that we'll have to work with and calculate that into the performance. Is there an allowance in the RFP in case the country imposes a possessory interest tax? Well, there is a tax, possessory interest tax. Um, I'm not certain if I follow the question. Is, is there an allowance for it? No. Yeah. no. So whatever the taxes are, you right. would have to incur those taxes. Would the airport consider breaking uh, package one into two pieces, say package 1A, 1B, of approximately equal sizes? And the answer to that is, is no. We're going to stick with the three packages that um, we currently have available. What is the ACDB participation for 2017? Um, the airport is required to, we're about 10.5%, 10.47, something like that. Uh, but we are a race control airport and we do everything we can do to encourage ACDB participation. We've um, taken the efforts to get folks certified in the past. We want ACDB participation. But uh, because we're raising the phone, the actual number that the FAA has allocated to us is about 10 minutes.
so there are two school kiosks, one on the south side that's attached to flames, and the other one is on the north side, it's a host kiosk near the Sunset News. Uh, those will both be going away because we're building a full-size restaurant in Terminal A Plus as part of the, the opening of that restaurant. The small kiosk in A Plus goes away and um, we will be also building a, a bagel shop next to Flames and when that opens, the kiosk next to Flames will also um, be removed. Does that answer the question there? Okay. Any other questions? Any other comments? Can we get alcohol to the menu at a location that currently doesn't serve alcohol? And the answer to that is um, most likely if uh, alcohol beverage control will allow that, we would consider that as well. We'll take a close look at it. We would not discourage it. Um, can we get RFP copies of previously submitted RFPs? Uh, we can. Just tell us which ones, what year, whether it's food and beverage. You know, we need a little bit more specific information. And um, we'll be happy to provide that information to you. Any, anyone else? Hi folks, my name is Drake. Oh wait, we did that. <laughs> um, but, <clears throat> excuse me, I just want to um, say thank you, thank you very much for coming out this morning. Uh, we're really excited about this program. As Kim talked about today, we haven't released an FMB uh, uh, RFP since 2008. We do have some, we're hoping that with the expansion of the gates, once we get past the expansion of the gates, down at the south side that will actually start uh, build, uh, building a larger terminal. We don't know if that's going to happen. We expect it to. And then at that point, we'll look to actually even divide the packages up even further, providing even more opportunities. So if um, you're not successful with this go-round, please keep yourself tied to the San Jose Airport, um, where it's a very dynamic airport. We have a lot of things that we're working on well beyond just what you can see right, right now. Um, we're, we're really pleased with, with the turnout so far. Uh, we um, ask that you respect the process and ensure that your communication, you're communicating through us only through Bitsync. The cutoff for the questions is next next Thursday, the 20th, 23rd. I better not say Thursday, it's Wednesday, so we make sure we have it. So Wednesday, okay. Um, finally, we, we touched on the fact that the RFP is due at 2 p.m. Who knows what time the proposal is due to the airport by? 2 p.m. What happens, what happens if you, Pacific Standard Time, what happens if you deliver it at 2.01? It is rejected as, that's right, it's rejected. So there's a lot of things that we can really kind of work through if you forget to sign something, you know, some minor technicalities that you forget. Remember, we've provided you a checklist. Go through that checklist on several times to make sure you've included everything. But if you deliver that package one minute late, it will be bid as it will be non-responsive and will be returned unopened. And I can tell you, I have seen that happen several times. I did an RFP actually a few years ago that Ms. Stewart was involved with uh, in Sacramento, and we had a package that flew in that morning from New York, and the package again was not. It wasn't. It didn't need to. The proposal wasn't due until 2 p.m. Flew in at 8 o'clock in the morning and was on a 9 o'clock flight back out to New York. We never got. We never got the proposal on time. They could track exactly where the package was the entire time. And sorry, Charlie. Yeah. So do not be late. It's the one thing that we really don't make any exceptions for. Uh, with that, I want to make sure I say a special thank you to Irv Tosk's phenomenal job today, and particularly to a special shout out to the property staff, Ms. Rebecca Bray, Marty Bagniuk, uh, uh, Megan Meg Kennedy, Megan Kennedy, and uh, I, I see 
some axis and data back there as well. So special, special, oh wait a minute, we've got somebody else. Seth Turner. Oh, Seth Turner, where is he? Oh, there he is. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm fortunate to be in charge of the properties group. I've got a, an incredible staff. I couldn't be happier with my staff. And so thank you guys very much. I know how much work you guys have put into this. So thank you folks, and I wish you all the best of luck. Thank you.